Hello everyone. Welcome to our Analytics Breakthrough webinar series. We're excited to have Mayra Brown with us today, um, finding the story in your data. Um, and before we get started, I just want to do a quick introduction. Uh, my name is Faris Alhalu, uh, co-author of our book, Google Analytics Breakthrough, and co-founder and principal consultant at Enor. With me, uh, my colleague and friend, Eric Fetman. He is also a co-author of the book and a senior consultant and an analytics trainer and coach at Enor. Hi, Eric. Hi, Ferris, and welcome, Meta, and welcome to our attendees. Thank you for joining us. And oops, sorry, we'll ask questions. We'll ask questions later. Uh, uh, very happy to have uh, Meta as a. Uh, as a contributor to the to the book, Google Analytics Breakthrough, to begin with, and also we're very happy that she's joining us today. We I, I know that years ago on the old Yahoo Web Analytics listserv that a lot of us used to uh, subscribe to, I, I saw Meta's post for years before was able to to connect directly. I said, hmm, this 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 person clearly has a has a has a really valid perspective on things. So very happy to have connected uh, later. And Meta has more recently done a, a series of uh, very, very uh, well-received usability uh, trainings with the, with the, digi with the uh, Digital Analytics Associ Association. Uh, not usability, Meta, you could, you could talk more about that tell, uh, user uh, Storytelling based on your your data rather than rather than usability specifically, but Meta could could tell us more about that. And also, just to pull up Meta's Amazon page, so Meta is a very well established and respected author in her own right. Uh, has has written uh, many essential books in the in the analytics field so very very happy to have her participate in the in our book project and to have her join us today so with that if you have any questions as we proceed with the with the webinar today please feel free to enter them into the question panel in go to webinar and with that we will Turn it over to Meta, Meta to tell us more about finding the story in your data. Welcome, Meta. I'm glad to be here. So, finding the story in your data. So, just to start off with the 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 book okay. scenario, we had a high. I think the scenario was high bounce rate on a on a mobile device. And you walk through the the, the the danger of of boring other people in your organization with just the the, the data and not not telling a, a story that would be concrete and have an emotional impact for for folks. So, could you tell us more about that, Meta? I would be glad to. Uh, and I would uh, like to show some pictures as I go along. Okay. However, as I as I click, I'm nothing is happening. Do you need to give me permission? Yes. Ah, there we go. Lovely. Oh, and we see it. There we go. So recently, um, I gave a talk to a group of data analysts. And after my presentation, a woman rushed up to me. And she was very excited. She said, there's a joke at my office that the boss always runs away when he sees me coming with a spreadsheet. Now I understand why and what to do about it. So if you would like managers to be more interested in what you have to say, stick with me for a few minutes and I'll give you some tips. We'll talk about stories, what they are and aren't why web analysts need to use stories, um, and um, what you can learn in my guest spot in Google Analytics Breakthrough from Zero to Business Impact. Um, but wait, okay, so who am I to be telling you this? I think that 
was mentioned a bit already, but I'm the author of uh, Data Finding for Dummies and some other things, and you may have seen my articles on Forbes or All Analytics or Smart Data Collectives or some other publications as well. Uh, but I'm also a hands-on data analyst, so I'm known for my work in statistics, data mining, and text mining. And my specialty is not so much doing analytics as bridging the communication gap between technical people like data analysts, web analysts, and engineers, and their non-technical managers, clients, or colleagues. So let's get back to the stories. You may have heard the term data storytelling. In fact, it's a popular buzz phrase right now. But it's often used in odd ways, or I certainly find them odd, and I think many others do as well. See, the right way to think of storytelling is the simple way. It's something that you do daily, and you do it well. When you sit with your friends over lunch, and you recount the tale of what happened in the office that morning, you tell stories. You talk about individual people, what they did, and what happened as a result. And when you tell those stories, everybody listens, and everybody understands. They also remember those stories, and it's easy for them to do so. People pay attention to stories, understand and remember stories, because that's what our brains do naturally. Now, you know what a story is. It's telling a, about a person, what she does, what happens as a result. You can do that. At lunch, you're a great storyteller. But back in the office, when you're talking to the boss, it may be different. In the office, you expect to do things differently. You don't tell stories. You make presentations. You're probably wearing something uncomfortable. And you feel uncomfortable, too. Maybe you heard about data storytelling, but it didn't sound like telling regular stories. It didn't sound like something you already know how to do. Maybe it involved data visualization or charts, or customer journeys, or a lot of other things that didn't sound like stories. And that is the wrong approach. Anything that includes a graph, an equation, a table, or heaven forbid software is not a story. There is no math in stories. Stories are about people, individual people one person at a time. So the right approach to data storytelling is to find the human experience behind your data and share it in the same straightforward style you use when you tell the stories at lunch. Data storytelling is the craft of sharing factual data-driven information in the form that people understand best, which is to say stories about individual people, their challenges, the actions that they take, and the results. Can you use the story form to share all the information you need to present about your analytics work? No, you can't, but that's okay. Web analysts need to use stories because you need to be understood. Now, your stories may be no more than a couple of sentences, but they have a vital role in your work. They're tools that you use to make information real for the listener. You can use them to introduce a topic, to spark interest, to provide a frame of reference for understanding details that you will share in other forms. If you open with a good story, one that's human and relatable, your manager will understand and pay attention to your work as never before. Now, at another of my talks, I met a web analyst. I'll call him Tom. And his boss was a nightmare. So Tom's boss ignored his presentations. 
He would do things like dialing the phone or even just walking out of the room right in the middle of a presentation. And I'm talking about one-on-one -on -one discussions. And he never acted on Tom's recommendations. Tom was very, very frustrated. Um, so much so um, that he was really desperate for change. And to get it, uh, he, he came to one of my events. Uh, to do this, he came out on the nastiest possible January evening in Chicago. I live here in cold, nasty Chicago. He took his own time. He paid his own money to attend on the hope of learning something that would help him get more influence at work. And he listened very carefully to what I had to say. A day later, Tom wrote to me. He would followed my advice. And for the first time ever, his boss listened to and acted on Tom's recommendations. That's what happens when you talk to people in a way that interests them and makes sense to them. And Tom was happy. So uh, what will you find in my guest spot in Google Analytics Breakthrough from Zero to Business Impact? Um, as you got a glimpse of earlier, the guest spot describes a common business problem that's reflected in web analytics and how it's reflected specifically in Google Analytics. And it explains why business managers don't share your sense of urgency about that problem and hint it's in the way you present it. Now in the example, I will look beyond the numbers to find the human experience behind them and then restate the information in story form. So you can see an example of how to take something that is probably already coming up in your work because and I know this because it comes up for almost every web analyst I speak with. And many are simply not able to get action because the manager doesn't necessarily understand what action to take or why it's important. So you'll see how telling the same thing in a story form, the right story form, brings out those technical details in a human way um, and helps you have more impact by getting more action in the workplace. So factual, grounded in data, shared in a form that everyone understands and remembers, that is data storytelling. And you can become a great storyteller because you're already, right, you can become a great data storyteller because you're already a great storyteller. To learn more, uh, read, whoops, I missed a slide there. Yep, go ahead and take a look at uh, Google Analytics Breakthrough from Zero to Business Impact. I'm on page starting 345. Uh, and if you're interested in uh, learning more or in-depth tra in -depth training or consulting to address specific technical challenges, you can contact me directly. I'll give you the contact information. With that, I'd like to open it for questions. Maida, could you tell us a little bit more about the the specific scenario that you detailed in the in the book? I think our uh, I think our our hero was was named Sunil. Yes, the hero was named Sunil. So let's let's take it for a moment without Sunil, the hero, without having that vision, and explain how I came to see that the same. The same technical problem was coming up over and over for people I knew who were dealing with web analytics. Um, the story was never told to me as a story first. Uh, what I would hear uh, was sometimes, we have a really high bounce rate, but I can't get this manager to commit to fixing the pages that are bouncing. Um, or I would hear, Guys, you can't just design for Chrome. <laughs> or I would hear, they're angry about lack of sales, but they won't make changes. Or I'd see the numbers put in front of me and watch people struggling with what they meant. They were all different ways of seeing the same problem. When we worked backwards looking at the numbers, how do we see the problem? You see specifically in the book the way that we see it in Google Analytics. If something is broken, if a page is not working, 
well, what happens is people don't do what you want them to do in the page. So you're likely to see that in a high bounce rate. People get onto the page, but they leave without doing whatever you were expecting them to do, like load the next page where they buy something, or click to request more information. Um, you see it in numbers, in percentages, um, and very often those percentages are, wow, you know, everything's bouncing, they don't like this page, right? Why, why does this bounce? They don't like the page. Why don't they like the page? Well, there could be a lot of different reasons. You have to investigate, but in this scenario, the page doesn't work. Now, you want all your pages to work, but in particular, uh, the page in question is the one where people buy. So if that doesn't work, what happens? You can't sell anything. So we're working backwards from what we see, what we know, to what had to happen to get that result. So we go from high bounce rate to um, where, where is it happening? Is it every page or a specific page? Oh look, it's this specific page. What happens when I look at that specific page? Holy Toledo, it does not work. I'm trying to buy, but I cannot buy. So that means that our customers can't buy either, and that means that we can't sell anything. We're working logically backwards, just like unraveling any any technical puzzle. We're, uh, we're unraveling what's the real life experience between what we're seeing technically. Well, we get it back to the page doesn't work. Users are coming and they can't buy. When we speak of it then to management in a broad way, uh, it doesn't really hit them where they live because they don't know if this is happening to everybody. They don't, we often don't get get back to it very much because we're saying to them, oh gosh, you know, we've got a high bounce right here, we've got this kind of error. They don't know what those things mean, but they know what it means when you make it more and more human. And in, in my guest spot, what I do is I take it all the way to a specific person who wants to who wants to make a purchase right now and he's got reasons for wanting to make that purchase and he really wants it. He's trying over and over and failing over and over and finally leaving in frustration. The person even has a specific name and there's a reason for that because it was selected to reflect what was known about the real life customers of that particular website. Um, so we're, we're taking apart things as abstract as percentages and making them back into that real person and what that real person lived through to be reflected in the numbers in our Google Analytics report or any type of analytics report. Maida, in your experience, once there is the more emotional hook, the more concrete hook, if you want to call it that, I don't want to call it hook because it's, I know it's more fundamental than that, but once we have, let's call it an anchor, once we have the, the, the anchor in terms of the, the persona and in terms of the, the, the pain that we've demonstrated for, for that persona, in your experience at that point, can the attention shift to the numbers? Does the quantitative data then start to make an impact, or is the impact generated purely from the storytelling aspect? What happens very often, and, and by the way, when I encourage uh, analytics professionals to tell stories, I don't mean make your entire presentation, whether it's 10 or 30 or 60 minutes long, a, a continuous story. I believe that's much too difficult and simply not necessary uh, for technical professionals, but I encourage you to use very short stories of just a few sentences, um, often at the beginning or peppered throughout your presentation, and, and I use the same word you chose, Eric, uh, anchors. <laughs> um, to 
give people a frame of reference. Uh, and yes, the attention can shift. One of the reasons that the attention can shift and yet people can, people, by which I mean your non-technical audience, can stay with the subject much more easily than if you did not use the story is this. The story gives them something to em envision which is more concrete for them than a batch of numbers or charts or whatever we might present as right. technical information. Uh, there, there are many more ways to, um, you know, enhance that sh throughout your presentation. But the first thing is that if you think about how how I just spoke to you, I, I opened with the picture of the woman running, because then you, everybody imagines her in a different way, but but everyone has a real picture in their mind of a person who realizes this is what's causing my problem and now I have an idea of what to do about it. Um, if you tell an executive we have a high bounce rate and they're not technical, that's not exciting to them. If you tell them, look at this guy who's trying to buy something from us and he can't, that's an image they can really understand. And uh, it used to be when I talked about data stories, I said we'd like them to have happy endings. Over time I've come to realize that that was completely ridiculous, that the stories that we, we tell as analysts in our presentations are most often ones that have very unhappy endings. Uh, the, the customer was unsuccessful in buying, uh, someone was un, unable to get a service they needed, right. something else bad, and it may not immediately be believable to that executive listener. Uh, and that is actually good because now they're annoyed with you and you have their attention. And they're going to start questioning you, looking at you suspiciously, and that is great because they're paying attention. And it becomes your job then to unfold facts in a way that responds to that executive's cue. I've, uh, I've written a lot about executive communications. You have to let them feel in charge, them feel that they are discovering the truth and dragging it out of you. <laughs> so there's a process to that, and, uh, and I won't try to lay it all out in just a couple of minutes. It's not, it won't be effective. But, uh, but the object is that you know what you want them to discover, and you're, you're looking for a way <clears throat> to let them feel that they discovered it. Um, and it often starts by presenting an unpleasant truth in a very um, striking way, um, possibly a visceral way, depending upon what you have going. So you're using the stories to get attention, to give people some sort of realistic image in their mind. And what you get out of it is attention. You buy their willingness to listen to you for a minute more or five minutes more or 20 minutes more, whatever it is, and, and they will interact with you, giving you the opportunity to come up with all that information that you have well prepared to supplement and to convince them that your story really is true, so they will understand the need to take action. Yeah, and even if you, if you take a data point that to analysts is so concrete and kind of emotional unto itself and actionable, at least it's signaling to us that we know we have to take action. If we look at conversion rate and we say, okay, well, you have a, you know, 1% conversion rate for your lead submission, whatever, whatever the conversion is. We look at that and, and we know that, well, that means in 99% of sessions, people aren't doing what we would we would like them to do ideally on the one hand we may react less to it because we we understand that a 1% conversion rate may be very very healthy if we were if we were speaking with Tom's boss and we said well, we have a 1% conversion rate probably on one level Tom's boss would be incredulous that only 1% of sessions, not that Tom Swass would think in terms of sessions, but that only 1% of the time, if we want to say that, that people did what we what we, we wanted them 
to do. So that would be that would probably be a shock for Tom's boss, Tom's boss if Tom's boss were listening. But just by presenting conversion rate, there probably wouldn't be the impact of okay. Imagine a hundred dots on the wall. One of them is is blue. All the other ones are white. Blue is your only success out of those out of those hundred dots. So the just going back to the idea that data points that are that that seem self-evident for analysts really in a lot of cases are, are very, very abstract and unemotional and un, unactionable for other people who aren't conversant with the just with the, the terminology and just the, the conversion optimization mindset. Well, let me take that, um, well, either a little further or take a different angle on it. We, for, we don't understand how deep we are into our own language until other people start asking us questions about, because they can't understand the stuff that we thought they did. And we forget how deep we get into language that seems simple to us but really is not understand by um, other people who don't share our specialty. So earlier in the presentation, I repeated a sentence. I tell them, guys, you can't just design for Chrome. Now, I remember that sentence vividly because I overheard it on the subway in Chicago. And I heard, you know, this gentleman saying that very emphatically, and I immediately knew exactly what his problem was. Right? <laughs> that he was he was talking about designing a website. The website didn't work in any browser except Chrome, and the business was losing sales because most people don't use Chrome, and the site wasn't working for them at all. That's how deeply he and I shared the same language. I wasn't even talking to him. It wasn't really any of my business that he was saying that. Right. But, uh, but I could go from that fragment all the way back. His manager can't do that. <laughs> His manager might not know what Chrome is. Uh, his manager doesn't understand what it means designing. Um, and certainly doesn't know how that relates to numbers or sales. And it's very, it's very challenging to stop and think, what, what do these people know? How can I tell this story in a way that everybody who's listening will know and everyone will understand how it relates to business? Uh, I, I have a colleague who's an expert in um, cross-cultural issues between Japan and the United States. Um, and she read some of my pieces about technical communications and she said that it was the same stuff that she would see you know, when dealing with people who are trying to bridge the gap between Japanese and English. Right. That's, that's how different our languages are from other people who may sit only a few feet away from us. So we have to make this effort. If we want influence, then we have to dial it back. And it's not easy to do that. It, it takes practice. And yet, again, we all, we all do it in ordinary conversation. The difference is the story that you can tell so easily to your coworker, how can we tell the same story so that not only the boss can understand it, but I often give people exercises to go practice, you know, over a beer with a buddy who works in a completely different industry and has a completely different education. And you'll quickly find out how deep you are into your own language and how much you have to back off and practice at that. But it's something that everybody can do because everyone does it already. Right, but we have to, we have to, Always stay aware of the the curse of knowledge, which is which is very pervasive, and I think that all of us feel that we're immune to it, and yes. no no one is, and no yes. no one is. So. And it, no one is, and it it 
it never completely goes away because I mean, after all, this is this is my profession, uh, and and I have done well with it, and many people have told me that they find it useful, and yet it's still not unusual for me to to touch, start speaking with someone who's you know far removed from the kind of industry that I'm in and find as I speak to them you can see in their face they don't understand what I'm saying and if I want them to understand I have to back off <laughs> and I have to figure out what what's comfortable for them and what's not and it's up, it's up to the speaker to change the way that you explain things until you put it in the listener's language, yes. not the other way around. Yeah, and, and one thing that as a as a trainer that I try to that I try to convey is that if you're an analyst, and especially if you're an analyst and an optimizer, then a big part of your responsibility is to communicate effectively. Actually, communication in in both directions, being receptive to usability inputs from other folks in your organization and from customers. So on inbound and outbound, making sure that you are communicating the data in the most effective way, whether that's using a non-default display in the tool that you're using, some kind of custom report, and even more fundamentally in framing the conversation in, in more human terms that transcend the, the, the data completely. Not completely, but are the or could potentially be the the entry point for the data when there otherwise may be a wall an impenetrable wall that your your audience would would not get past so maybe we are we are at time for the for the webinar so if you could tell us one key takeaway from our discussion and also let folks know where to connect with you and if you're going to be making any Live appearances anywhere, please let us know. I'd like the takeaway to be that if what you want is more influence, and most analysts do, we want people to act on the information that we have to offer, then the way to get it is to get your points across in a way that makes people feel, oh my gosh, this is a terrible problem, and I know what to do about it, and I can act. Um, and that takes practice. Mm. Influence, okay. It, like that. Communication is all about getting influence, right? It's, we want people to act on what we do. We want our work to be valuable and valuable work is reflected in action. I will be speaking in May at Interop ITX, um, and I'm frequently adding additional events to the calendar, so um, you, can watch, you can watch my Twitter or drop me a line, and I will let you know what's coming up. Um, I'm, I have more events in planning, but they're not ready to announce yet. If you have, uh, if you're facing a particular communication issue in your own organization and you might need something more in depth, uh, I do workshops, as Eric mentioned earlier. Uh, I consulting and, and other forms of assistance to help bridge those communication gaps between technical experts and non-tech. So you can always contact me. You have the information on your screen. And I look forward to meeting some of you in person and speaking with you. Thank Great. you so much. Thank you very much, Meta, and thank, thanks, folks, for attending. Make sure to connect with Meta and also more information on Google Analytics Breakthrough at gabreakthrough.com, to which Meta contributed a number of other folks in the industry contributed and we've gotten very positive feedback so far. So thank you very much, Meta, and thank you everyone for attending. Good to talk.